and everything. Um, okay. Everyone can hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, but the presentation, okay. I think, I ah, yeah. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine? Yeah. So you're, you're ready to start? OK. OK, so your time starts now. Go ahead. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm here to present my uh, research paper today. And I don't want to start with my topic, but I just want all of you to look at the picture. And we see 12 girls over here. If we can count it, we see 12 girls over here. But we see them smiling. We see them bold. We see them uh, standing strong. We're not able to see the picture clearly. Okay. Yeah, it's clear oh, now. This feels better. Okay, let me start again. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm here to present uh, my research topic today. And I don't want to start with my research topic, as I already told you. Uh, we see the picture of 12 women over here. And how we see them, we see them bold, we see them smiling, we see them uh, standing strong. We don't see anything wrong in the picture. But what we don't see is there are four people hidden in the picture. They are not exactly smiling, they are not exactly bold, but they're acting out. And statistics says that one in three women in India uh, have been sexually abused, have had that experience in their life, but uh, they battle silently on the inside. So when we say one in three, it has an opportunity for someone to be in your church who might have faced it, who might have gone through it. And here I am presenting about the restoring hope, examining the transformative impact of the gospel in the lives of sexually abused girls and women from the city of Bengaluru. So what is sexual abuse? Sexual abuse is also referred to as molestation. It's an abusive sexual behavior by one person upon another. It is often perpetrated using force or by taking advantage of the other. My research primarily focused on three things. First, it, they should be girls and women. We are not focusing on uh, the male gender. And we are also focusing uh, the women and girls in the city of Bangalore. And we are also focusing the people who have experienced healing through gospel. Uh, there are people who experience uh, healing through therapy. Some, uh, there are other religion people who try to heal themselves through various methods. But uh, since my research focus on the impact of the gospel, we are uh, focusing on the people who experience healing through gospel. And we all are well aware of what the gospel is. We've been studying for the past three years. We know the gospel can comfort us. It can heal us. It can bring uh, the joy in us. It can renew our mind. It can renew our thoughts. It can strengthen us. It makes us feel loved. And it equips us. And there are so many things that the gospel does to us. And I believe it's the same for the one who has experienced abuse in their life. They deserve to listen to the gospel. And I have analyzed the data of 30 women uh, from the city of Bangalore who have experienced healing through gospel. It's not like they never went on counseling. It's not like uh, they never sought help in somewhere else. But they felt like ultimately the gospel has played a crucial role in their healing journey. I just want to show some uh, statistics uh, results that I found uh, through my research. Uh, we're going to see at what age in the city of Bangalore uh, mostly people are being abused and by whom they are being abused by. And we're also going to see the means of gospel that helps them and the impact that it creates on them. So according to the data that I have collected, most of the people are abused uh, during their childhood from the age 0 to 12. The least that I found is five years old. And from 0 to 12, they are abused um, most often. It's because of the innocence that they have. And as a child, they don't understand what really happens to them. And they believe whatever the person says. And they don't even realize until uh, they understand what's really happening, until someone explains to them. 
And the next uh, set of age would be 13 to 19. And in the city of Bangalore, it happens uh, mostly because of uh, uh, it's a city culture and uh, boys and girls, uh, they, they try to be in relationship at a very young age. Uh, most of the cases uh, that I analyzed, uh, they were in the teenage, uh, they were uh, trying to be searched for love. Uh, and in turn, they get sexually abused. And the next age will be 20 to 39. And I never found a case from 40 to 59 or 60 plus, uh, which doesn't mean that no one gets abused in that age, but uh, abuse is hidden in the name of marriage. That's what uh, I believe in most of the time women to uh, step out and say about it. And most of the women are abused by their relatives. When I say relatives, I mean uh, those who are in the blood relation of the family. Uh, it could be cousin, it could be uncles, uh, or anyone who's the aunt, or anyone who's uh, in the blood line of the family that's what I mean by relatives. Strangers doesn't mean someone who's on the road, but uh, some most of the time it's the next two uh, people uh, whom the parents leave just to take care of the child. Sometimes they go to some classes. And those are the one I categorize as strangers. And sadly, even uh, people who grew up in a dysfunctional family are abused by their father as well. And some are abused by their friends, which includes uh, relationship uh, like boyfriends as well as uh, the opposite gender uh, friends that they have in their life. And there's so much trust uh, behind the person uh, which uh, develops into a stage of abuse later. So let's come to the impact the gospel creates and how the impact is being created. Most of the time, it's created because of the small groups that's in the church. Uh, people find it easy to get attached in a small group than to get attached to the whole congregation. So they say when we are in a small group, we get the time to talk about what's happening with our life. We get the time to encourage each other. So 24% of uh, my research, uh, they all said small group help does a lot. Uh, interaction with the people, uh, just sharing our story with them, and uh, they keep it confidential. That helps them a lot. And the next comes to biblical counseling. Thankfully, in the city of Bangalore, there are many faith based counselors uh, also uh, available over here. So they try to get into counseling and to get heat. And LC is actually a local church. Uh, the preachings in the local church, we all know that uh, most of the time that people uh, battle silently, they don't let it out, they don't uh, tell what exactly uh, happening with them. So the preaching in the local church, like the love of Christ, the forgiveness, the cross, the healing, uh, every preaching somewhere, it, it touches them and that also heals them. So these people, they don't step out and say they need help, but uh, they acquire help through the message that is being preached, which tells us that let there be no idol talks at church. We are here to preach the gospel. Let's, let's do it. Let's make sure that we are preaching the love of Christ every single day. And this is one of the most interesting fact that 15% of them uh, are coming into a healing process of gospel because of what they heard in children's church. And that was very surprising to me. Uh, most of the people uh, that I analyzed were born Christians. So they fall away from Christianity for some time. And then when life hits hard, they again remember what they have heard in children's church. And that helps them back uh, to be uh, with Christ. So children's church is a very powerful ministry. What they heard about the cross, the love of God, somewhere it's it's imprinted in their heart at a young age. And they remember after the abuse, what they heard, and they, and they come back to Christ, come back to the uh, healing process, the gospel. PSA is preaching of sexual abuse, which is found very rare. Uh, so people who are uh, gone for abuse, they tend to search in the internet uh, on any preaching about healing sexual abuse. Is there any pastor preaching about it? Is there any preaching on it? Is, is there a biblical reason or biblical hope that I can hold on? So this is uh, not found in most of the churches. And I think this should be implied in the churches to preach about it, that there is healing even for those who are sexually abused. HM is healing ministries. There are uh, some healing ministries uh, which happens for like seven days straight, eight days straight. Uh, they counsel people there, they pray for people there, and six percent of them are. Okay, one minute more. 
Yeah, and then the finally it comes to the friends, or uh, heals uh, the people. So there are four major areas that the people get healed. It's their identity, their pattern of thoughts, their relationship, and the area of forgiveness that helps them. So what would I like the church to do? Make sure that you have small groups, women groups. Make sure there is biblical uh, counseling at church. There are preachings about forgiveness and the love of God. And also make sure that there's a powerful Christian uh, children's church over there. These are the impacts that the gospel creates on them. And finally, I want the church to not to be silent about this because people are in need of the gospel. Thank you. Thank you, um, Jeffina. <clears throat> um, so um, I just have one question. So it was a well thought out, uh, well researched. Um, so uh, can you just tell uh, probably a couple of questions? Can you tell me about the sample size that you used? Like how many respondents from which you gathered this data? Like how many people were interviewed or how many people? Yeah. So I. I had a thought to interview about 50 people, but I ended up interviewing 30, which I was able to find someone. Uh, so it's a collection of data of 30 uh, women uh, from the city. OK, 30 is the sample size. OK, OK. OK, okay. so um, just one more question. Now, in, in all these respondents, uh, what about abuse in church? You know, have you? Did you ever explore that, um, you know, sexual abuse in church? People who are in church was that um, something that came about, and how would you, what would you recommend? Yeah, so there were two cases where uh, it was the father who abused them, and the father is uh, actually a mighty minister at church. He volunteers so good, and. Uh, this child uh, was abused at a young age by the father continuously. And she stated uh, to me uh, that people would never believe if I go and tell that my dad does this to me because my dad uh, was volunteering, going on mission trips. And so it, do, it does happen at church. So what would I recommend is that I think there should be teachings on family structures as well, what the father has to do, what is the role of the father, uh, not just uh, inspiring someone to volunteer. Uh, family is not being preached much, maybe. And to also believe, uh, also comes to that awareness that people could be ministers and also uh, still uh, be abusive uh, at home. There could be different domains at home. And, uh, Churches. I think uh, teachings on family uh, should mm. be in churches. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Jeffina. God bless. Okay. So who's next? Uh, we have Lubega and we also have uh, Divya. So, um, Divya, would you like to present this? Sure, sure, Pastor. Um, okay, you can set up your uh, presentation, I'll, and then once you're ready, let me know. And then, sure. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Pastor. Right. Um, in the meantime, Lubega. Oh, uh, Lubega, you can get ready. So immediately after the Vyas, you can go. Uh, you can start, right? Okay. Sure, Pastor, I'll be ready. Okay. But it is it, it's raining here, so that's why my network is disturbing. But uh, I'm ready. Sure, sure. It's 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 quite clear. You can go ahead. No worries. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, Divya, you are set? Yes, yes, Pastor. Uh, yeah. Can I share my screen? Yeah, please. Mm -hmm. 
Are you able to see? Um, just a minute. Yeah, it's just coming up. Yeah. Yeah, it's on the presenter view, but it's it's fine. We can see it. Mm. Okay. Yeah. No worries. You can go ahead. Uh, I'm going to also switch on your camera. Um. Yeah. Sure. Um, okay. Okay. So to do that, um, should I be uh, okay, okay. Yeah, best. Yeah. yeah, we can see you now. Okay. OK, you can, um, you're ready to start? Shall I yeah. start the time? Oh, okay. yeah. yeah. Yeah, Pastor, I just want to um, like yeah. uh, know about the controls. Uh, is it? Uh, so you're able to see my. Um, yes. Yeah, we can see your screen. We can see you, and we can see your um, uh, presentation as well. OK, so uh, I'm trying to understand how to move my slides. Like. Mm -hmm. Uh, you just have to click on it. Does it help? Um, click on the next slide. Um, you have the presenter view, right? So on the next slide, at the left, um, left extreme, you have slides which are listed, one, two, three. So either that, or you can do a page down and see if it moves to the next screen. Yeah. Um, OK, I'm just going to try with this. Uh, okay. Actually, the screen is uh, kind of uh, showing as disabled for me. So that's why I'm not able to. OK. OK, try switching off your camera, and then you can present it, please. Sorry. If that helps. Yeah, I'll, I'll just try. Yeah. <laughs> Still, I'm uh, seeing like it's disabled. Um, so is there anything else that I need to? Um, yeah, like what I'd suggested, you can actually save it as a PDF and then present it. That's also fine. OK, sure. Yeah, so files. OK, so in the meantime, we'll ask Lubega to um, present. OK. Yeah, OK, you can just uh, get set with that. Um, let's see. Um, so I'm just going to pin Lubega. Yeah, Lubega, go ahead, please. Uh, you, if you have a presentation, um, try and put it. OK. I sent my details to you. No, if you have a PowerPoint, you can you can share that, share screen. OK. Do you have that? I have. Yeah. Um, it's not coming up. Okay. At the bottom of the screen, you will see um, 
you know, a box with an arrow pointing to the top. That's the icon which you should use in order to share. So it says, if you are you are you presenting from a laptop or from your phone? I'm presenting from a laptop. Yeah. And when I so, I'm sorry. Say that again. I'm saying when I I, I click on present now. Yeah. Bring me another screen which says show what to share with the meet and uh... right. So your presentation has to be open, and it will also it will come up. Okay. It's open okay, on the screen. So it is open on my yeah. So yeah so when you when you say present now this um the 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 arrow with the box that icon you click that and then you get to choose what you're presenting okay mm -hmm. unless if i open it in chrome i say i i i put my 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 presentation into this tab can i do that because i can see uh, um no you, you can either when you say present you, you can either have a chrome tab you can either have a window um, i have a window so if the yeah click on window and see if your presentation is coming up there Okay, the only of the only it... object give me is okay. Let me go to window. Okay, fine, fine, fine. It is now here. Yeah, so click on that. It's not that come up. OK, so yeah, it's coming up now. OK. Yeah, it's coming up now. So you can. So are you able to move this uh, slides from one yeah. slide to another? Yeah, OK. So OK, we'll start your timer now. OK, your time starts now. Please go ahead. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. My name is Rega S. Collins, and my instructor is Mr. Jal Kumar Isaiah. I'm here presenting my individual research paper for the award of a bachelor's in theology from the university or from APC Bible College, Bangalore, India. My topic is and was the biblical view on sexual immorality and its implication on my local church and my statement of problem is, despite the emphasis on moral values, ethic conduct in running culture, reports of social misconduct, abuse, and inappropriate behavior within religious settings have emerged. This research aims to examine the violence, root causes, consequences, and sexual immorality in the running churches. I had the general objective. The general objective of the study was to assess the biblical view on sexual immorality and its implication on local churches. And after the general objectives, I had three specific objectives. One was to evaluate the effect of union of a man and a woman on sexual immorality in Chigali, Rwanda, particularly in a church they call Zion Temple, where I attend. Second was to determine the effect of purity and passion on sexual immorality at my church, which is Zion Temple. And third was to, to establish effects of this interpretation on sexual immorality at Zion Temple. I had a conceptual framework. I had first, I had an independent variable and a dependent variable. The independent variable was biblical view, and the dependent variable was sexual immorality. Union of a man and a woman 
There is legally parental consent, payment of dowry, consent of both parties. There was also purity and passion under that. There is God's plan, right channels, a product of love, respect of ladies in pure days. Third was resisting temptation. Under that, there is pray, praying together, reading the Bible together, fasting together, attending church together. And when you go to the independent variable, there is fornication, adultery, polygamy, lesbianism, incest, and rape. My research design, population size, sample size, data collection methods. My research design in nature was descriptive, whereby the study involves collecting of data at a single point in time in, in the target population, whereby I would get the information without manipulating it and present it in this finding. The population size was, I used 140 people at the Temple Kigali. Since the number was 140, I did not need to calculate the sample size. I did not need to calculate the, the details because all of them were going to give me and they gave me all their details. The data collection methods I used, there was documentary review, questionnaires, and interviews. Dear the chairman of the panel, allow me present, continue presenting my findings. Here, since I had three specific objectives when I collected the data, and these are the tables that I developed. I used what we call the Lichen scale, whereby I used this four, five, four of the strongly agree, strongly, uh, there is agree, disagree, and strongly di disagree. So when you look at how pastors, when you come to the first of all, the, the first one, which was perception of, of the re respondents on the effects of union of a man and a, and a woman on sexual immorality at Zion Temple, many of them believe that the, the pastors are doing their work. When you look at the first one here, there is 32% strongly agree and 45 percent agree when you look at uh, the next one is 45 percent agree 27 percent ag strongly agree 20 percent agree like that as my research paper would show since time is not my best ally i will go to the next one when you look again at at this one this is my second specific objective where the respondents perception on the effects of purity of passion on sexual immorality at Zion Temple. Many of them still were saying that they agree the church is doing its work. For instance, teachings on purity, passion are always given to church members. When you look here, 60% they agree and 12.2 strongly agree that this is being done at church. Zion church members always attend seminars about purity and passion. You see 60.7% agree and 26.4 strongly agree. When you look at purity and passion is in a general and common call for all church members, they also, when you look at my statistics here, 50% agree and 28.6% agree. When I go to my third specific objective, out of the 140 respondents, when you look at one of my variables here, which, which says the church members at Zen Temple practice self-care, 100% agree that they, they do, the, do this. But my question is, why are they still doing this? In my conclusion, Pastor, or the member of the panel, the Bible condemns sexual immorality, defining it as any sexual activity outside the bonds of marriage between man and woman. This includes adultery, Premarital sex, homosexual behavior, and other forms of sexual activity deemed immoral by scripture. The church leadership includes pastors and elders play a role in upholding the teachings, the teachings of these standards. They are responsible for providing biblical guidance and ensuring that the church community remains faithful to these teachings. My recommendation is. Addressing church immorality in running churches requires a multifaceted approach that considers cultural, social, and religious factors. Here are some of my recommendations. 
pastor teaching and counseling should continue. Education and awareness should be done in church. Oh. Accountability and discipleship should be done, whereby we should have discipleship programs such as the APC 12 sales groups, to mention but a few. Also, youth and family members and family programs must be inculcated to make sure that sexual immorality is kicked out of the Church of Christ. With that said, I want to thank you for your kind attention. And I'm here to hear your recommendation and supplements or any question. I get back to you, Pastor. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Lubega. So, so this uh, seems to have been a study about, um, um, you know, whatever the church has, church is doing, and how the church members perceive um, the, the effort taken by the church and uh, the different avenues provide or the teaching provided by the church, church to address this particular problem of sexual immorality. But um, I just wanted to know, you know, what are your thoughts on the problem in the church? You know, to what extent is there a problem? Did you do any research on that? Right? Because uh, the sample size is very impressive, 140. But um, I'm just thinking that they, uh, there could have been a, a study on uh, the problem, the existing problem, you know, if there is an existing problem. Because, you know, there is an assumption that there is a problem. So was any research work done on um, what is the nature of the problem? And if the respondents are part of the problem, do they agree that, you know, personally they are part of the problem? I, I did not understand your question, Pastor. The question is, you know, there is an assumption here that at this particular church that there is sexual immorality and um, and then you've gone about um, uh, to find out what is the method or the ministry of the church in addressing that. But uh, my question is, you know, was any effort taken to find out um, what is the nature of sexual immorality in that particular church and how you can conclusively say that to this extent you know there is a problem there is a problem in the church of sexual immorality of this nature was any effort taken to first uh, find that out um, before you know saying that because everybody's agreeing that this is the church's method and yes we agree with that they are doing this great job but um, yeah my question is prior to that was any effort to f undertaken to find out the yeah. extent to which the problem was there, the nature of the problem? Yeah, please go ahead. The problem is there. And when you look into my research, I literally put there my recommendation in further studies, saying that further studies must be done to find out what the this problem, how can they be litigated or mitigated to make sure that it does not happen in the Church of Christ, especially at the Zion Temple. Because when I was asked, and when I was with these respondents, when you read through my research, you will realize that many of them are university graduates, some are undergraduate and others are, are holding master's degree. When you look into my sample size and what, they literally know what they were doing because I would inquire from them. And if you know what you're doing, why, what prompts you not to change? But since some of the information is very sensitive and uh, people are usually blaming others, they say this and this, the pastor must continue doing this and the other. But uh, true, it is happening. And that's what my recommendation in further studies were saying that research must be done and we find answers from them. Because if they are the people who are doing this, they should be having the answers. Thank you, sir. Yeah. OK. Thank you, Lubega. Um, thank you for that. Pastor, I shared all my details uh, in your email because when I was trying to attach it, it did not accept again. Yes, yes. I've gone through the report, so which is why I asked this question, because there is no questionnaire about the person contributing to the problem. You know, so that that was my question. Um, there is no questionnaire or research to find out. Okay, this is the percentage. This is the nature of the problem. 
uh, the nature of the problem is assumed, and that is that is why I asked this question, right? So I've gone through your report as well, right? Thank you, thank you. Okay. Okay, so um, uh, if Divya is ready, we can have Divya's presentation right now. Sure, Pastor. I'll try again to share my screen. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I think um, Lubega has to stop sharing his screen. Yeah. Thank you, Lubega. Sure. Is my screen visible? Yeah, it is. Yeah. And you're able to see it um, moving right. as well, right? Right. Okay. Right. Okay. okay. Thank you. So I shall try putting my video as well. Okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. Your time starts now. Yeah. Um, so uh, my research paper uh, for uh, the independent research paper in uh, APC Bible College was regarding uh, leveraging the potential of artificial intelligence for increasing the efficiency and impact of Christian ministry. Uh, why I chose this to topic is because we know that uh, with the emergence of uh, OpenAI's chat GPT in the uh, uh, in November 2023, they ha there has been a lot of mass media attention on AI, and it's it's a field that is impacting uh, like all domains, um, every product that we can think of, every domain that we can think of is being impacted by AI. So why not uh, use AI in Christian missions um, uh, and before that, uh, before that, uh, we just need to have uh, an idea regarding, you know, uh, the basic concepts of AI, its history, uh, major AI technologies and techniques, and uh, the fears um, and issues and concerns that pastors and church leaders um, and Christian ministers have regarding AI, and also some ethical considerations that we need to take into account. So, uh, as I said, field of AI is constantly evolving and increasingly getting embedded into our lives. If you have, uh, if you have used voice assistants like Siri, uh, Alexa, it it is operating on AI. And uh, have you noticed your social media feeds recommending, uh, you know, uh, based on uh, your previous searches or online shopping sites? Um, uh, that are giving you recommendations based on your preferences uh, or even the maps and navigation. How does it um, help us um, find the most suitable route when we are going to a particular destination? Uh, we also are aware of uh, how smart homes are coming into picture as well as, um, you know, the Google autocomplete uh, that, is, uh, that is embedded into the Google search. All these are ways in which we are already using AI. And um, though the boom um, has been noticed in um, the last couple of years, this has been a, um, a um, this has been a technology that has been um, um, started or founded uh, in the 1950s. Uh, uh, the uh, father of computer science, Dr. Alan Turing, um, he uh, had published a paper uh, posing the question, can computers think like humans? So that was uh, the first step towards the, de the you know, research in AI. Uh, but later on, um, there was a, a period called AI winter during the 1970s because of the challenges that uh, researchers faced in um, making these 
artificially intelligent machines. And in 1980s, there was a boom because of the uh, uh, expert systems uh, used in medicine, finance, and other industries. And 1990s and 2000, there was a rise of machine learning, which enabled image and speech recognition. And 2000, 2020s, in the current decades, what we are seeing is an improvement in the different algorithms, uh, the uh, deep learning algorithms and uh, reinforcement learning, which are uh, based on artificial uh, neural networks, or they are based on uh, how our human brain works. So advances in all these has led to um, uh, AI revolution, we could say. And um, just to go, uh, go on with the basic concepts, what is artificial intelligence? It's actually, uh, it's a it's a defined as a science and en uh, engineering of making intelligent machines. If machines can have uh, the uh, the ability to perform tasks that require human intelligence, for example, visually perceiving something, speech recognition, decision making, translation between languages, all those cognitive functions that humans do, learning, reasoning, problem solving, language understanding, creativity, all these, if a machine is able to simulate it, then um, that is what is called artificial intelligence. And there are lots of, um, um, you know, subsets uh, involved with artificial intelligence, like machine learning, uh, reinforcement learning. I'm going. Uh, I'm not going into the uh, depths of it because of constraint of time. Uh, so there is machine learning, reinforcement learning, deep learning, uh, natural language processing. All these have uh, contributed to this AI revolution. And as I mentioned, deep learning is based on. Uh, it works based on a human. Uh, brain, the neural networks in our brain. So uh, it helps with recognizing patterns and identifying objects. Um, and also natural language pro uh, processing is the ability of a machine to read and understand content produced by humans, to create natural language that sounds as if a human were actually speaking or writing. So these con these um, uh, uh, concepts are the basis of um, innovations like chat GPT. So that's important to know. Uh, however, I would like to uh, uh, make you also aware about, uh, you know, there are concerns among um, uh, our church communities over AI adoptions and Christian missions. Some of the questions they raise are, um, is it okay to talk about AI in the church? Should I be concerned about AI? Can AI help me in my ministry? Are other people preaching on AI? Will AI help me grow closer to God? And what are the AI tools that could help me? So um, there are lots of questions, and these are genuine questions, uh, because it's uh, artificial intelligence is so pervasive in terms of its potential applications that there are many questions that uh, and issues that it uh, brings up. Um, and also, we uh, uh, there are we, we should not approach this technology uh, from uh, the uh, fear uh, on a fear ba fearful basis, but we should approach it in a theological way, in a biblical way, because all technologies are. Uh, a, a good gift from God to enhance human flourishing and to improve the common good. So, um, uh, however, uh, with all these uh, advancements, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, with a survey uh, con conducted by uh, AI and uh, church survey, um, it was a survey that was developed in conjunction with a working group of partners, including Barna Group, AI and Faith. And according to that survey, around 1,573 people, like church um, uh, ministers and volunteers, they participated in the survey. And it, uh, it showed that uh, around uh, 43 percent, uh, I mean 41 percent, uh, they believe that only uh, church should use 
AI moderately. Nine percent, uh, they say that they, we can enthusiastically leverage the technology. Seven percent say that church should condemn it. So there are varying opinions about this. And it is important that um, our church community, our Christian communities are being made aware. So some of the ways um, uh, to unlock the power of AI is to experiment with free tools, because nowadays with a lot of um, uh, with a lot of technologies, AI is being embedded technologies like uh, Canva, Grammarly, uh, so, uh, so uh, we we can use um, and these is uh, these tools are open to public and we can okay, experiment. One minute with the free tools and um, yeah, ChatGPT is one of the uh, major um, boom uh, that happened in November 2023. It can save time. It can improve preaching quality. It can broaden our research. It can improve interpersonal communications. Uh, some sample use cases are responding to congregational emails or inquiries. That that is in communication aspect. It can uh, uh, help us in. Uh, 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 greater efficiency, drafting staff or volunteer policy documents, and even planning, pastoral care, volunteer management, and many such things. And uh, we also uh, have other tools uh, that we can use, uh, as I already mentioned, tools like Grammarly, um, that helps correct grammatical errors, spelling mistakes, and punctuation errors. Uh, then email applications. There are lots of tools like Superhuman, Spark Mail, Shortwave, all help add functions. Yeah, I think uh, time's up, uh, Divya, so we'll stop here. Um, yeah, just one quick question before we wrap up. So, mm -hmm. you know, you know that um, India, in India, if you see a setting where a lot of things are rural, uh, most uh, in, they say India is a you know place of villages and so on. So, how would I, AI help in reaching out to rural India? Um, you know, you consider a typical village setting where electricity is a problem. Um, you get electricity in a few hours in a day, and you know, how do you think AI would help um, you know someone like you maybe to reach out to rural India? Any thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, how AI is perceived in uh, different cultural settings in different regions are uh, is um, uh, it, it's widely varied uh, in different sectors. So in rural India, I believe um, uh, the one good thing about um, tools, AI tools, are it's it's very simple. It even uh, a, a person need not be. Uh, technologically advanced to uh, operate uh, the AI tools like ChatGPT, it's uh, because it's based on things like natural language processing. It can interact just like humans interact with each other. Uh, yeah, I understand the um, constraints of not having electricity or internet. It can be a difficulty, um, but uh, still. Um, we know that smartphones, they are accessible to everyone nowadays. So uh, AI is kind of, uh, uh, you know, a, uh, becoming a general purpose tool where it is available at our fingertips. So in the course of time, I believe in, even in rural India, it will, uh, you know, um, have a great impact. Mm. Right, Divya, thank you. Thank you for uh, the presentation. OK, um, yeah, so just a quick word for those who are going to be presenting tomorrow. Um, so uh, we're going to be starting with, um, OK, uh, yeah, we're going uh, to have Zelitoli, then Success, then Subhashish and Abu Bakr. So you know, please be ready. And uh, please do try out your presentation. Uh, earlier you know pr prior to um, coming joining the class just try it out you can just set up any google meeting and then try it out so that you'll be uh, you'll be fine okay um yeah yeah lubega you have a question i was asking pastor can i attach my questionnaires on the research paper i sent you or i send it as a separate 
a, a separate document so that you really see that it, it's no assumption in the, the data that I yeah. gave you. No, and uh, the thing is, uh, it should have been part of the report, Lubega, actually. Um, you know, a sample questionnaire, it should be part of the appendix. Um, so, uh, but okay, you can send it to me. You can email me. I'll take a look at it as well, right? When I'm evaluating the project report, I'll take a look at it. But ideally, it should be part of that report as an appendix. Um, so that's fine. You can, you can email me, right? Thank you. A separate document, so, or uh, a, a separate document, or I I add it on the other one and I resend it. Yeah, you can add it and send it, please. Um, just make sure it's it conforms to that twenty-five to thirty pages. Uh, I didn't check the, you know, the number. That was the okay. challenge. Part. When you look on yeah. my document, I sent almost yeah. forty-one pages, but when you look at the 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 real work, is thirty pages. Mm -hmm. so okay, I will take a look at. Yeah, yeah, that's the thing. So the challenge is to make it concise so that it fits in, and uh, yeah, so that's always a challenge. But you can send me the questionnaire maybe as a separate document. I let me go through it, right? Okay, uh, but I won't, uh, you know, mark it. I won't be able to. But I let me for my understanding. I'll just go through it, right? Okay, I can see some. Something in the chat. Okay, regional language translations. Yes, thank you. Okay, so uh, we'll we'll meet tomorrow. Tomorrow we are meeting at nine a.m. Right for the for the next round of um, presentations. Yes, success. You have a question. Yes, sir. Um, I overheard my name because I just uh, went to go and pick up something. It's tomorrow. I'm doing my presentation tomorrow, and have I've sent you all my documents. Uh, my presentation the last time. So, is there any other thing I want to submit to you? I don't know. If... No, if you submitted the report, see, last time was just the update of status. The final submission was supposed to be done before 9 a.m. today. You know, we've been repeating that. I'm sorry, I'm repeating it again. So, so that is the thing. So, if you have not done it, which means the report has not come in to me yet. Okay, uh, please. Okay. Uh, I will do that before tomorrow 9 a.m. Please permit me to do so. Please. No, if you, you can, you please send it today because it's already late. Kindly send it today. I can't, uh, there will be some kind of a penalty in the sense I can't mark it for 75. I'll have to, you know, uh, I, you, you know, you must understand that because I very clearly we mentioned, we put it on the thing that before 9 a.m. on the 4th. Is the um, so late submissions will carry? I can't extend the date. Late submissions will carry some kind of minus marks, right? So please send it today. Do not wait till tomorrow. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Divya, you have your hand up. Any? Yeah, Pastor. Even um, I uh, couldn't submit before time, so I had emailed you. Uh, uh... Yeah, I, I I got the email. I got the email. I went through the report. So, okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 Thank okay. you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So we'll wrap up today, right? Uh, we'll meet again 9 a.m. Thank you so much. God bless you guys. Bye bye.